Hey guys, Buildzoid here, and today I figured I would talk about the differences in how AMD and NVIDIA do their power monitoring. Not power management, though technically, you know, you can't really manage your power consumption if you don't know how much power you're pulling. Um, so this video is sort of a, like, th this lays down the groundwork for how their various power management systems work, and basically how AMD's doesn't work. Um, not that I, you know, I personally don't care about this because I make a hobby out of making cards pull 500 watts, but, um, pull ridiculous amounts of power. But for a lot of users, th this is going to be interesting. It'll explain some, like, a lot of people wondered how on earth the RX 480 doesn't, like, limit itself to not pull more than 150 watts. We'll go over that. Um, it also explains some of the weirdness that some people have observed on NVIDIA cards. Um, and some of the lack of weirdness on, well, some of the differences between NVIDIA and AMD. And the reason why I'm doing this right now is because I want to, in the future, investigate uh, the whole daisy-chained power connectors thing. And I know there's a video by Jay-Z Two Cents about daisy-chained power connectors where he shows how it actually impacts performance on NVIDIA GPUs, but I'm not able to repl replicate that on an AMD card. It doesn't make a difference. And I'm 99% sure it's down to how AMD and NVIDIA do their power management. So that's why we're going over this. The other thing is if you're modifying an AMD GPU BIOSes and anytime I'm talking about AMD GPU power limits, I feel like th this is just gonna be more like, it will make a lot more sense for a lot of people because like Vega, uh, 64, for example, is specced at 295 watts, right? That's, if you're looking at the, like, if you look at the uh, GPUs, uh, the Tech Power Up GPU database, there's a 295 watt power spec, power consumption spec. If you actually look at any reviews, Vega pulls around 300, almost 300 watts from the PCIe slot and the eight pins. Um, but if you actually look at a Vega BIOS, you'll find out that the BIOS is, set to 220 watts and to a lot of people that's like okay what how does that work how do you have a card that pulls almost 300 watts with a 220 watt bios power limit well it comes down to the massive differences in how amd doesn't measure power consumption and nvidia does so here we have a founder's edition 1080 ti pcb and it uses the same current measurement method methodology that like well, power measurement methodology that basically every AM NVIDIA card pretty much ever as far as, well, I'm sure if you go either low end enough, like, you know, dog cards that cost under a hundred bucks, they might lack this circuitry because it just costs too much to implement. And if you go far enough back in history, you'll find cards that lack this circuitry because uh, it was deemed unnecessary at the time. But as of right now, uh, like 900 series, 700 series, 10 series, um, you know, all these cards use this power management methodology, which is this chip right here, which that is a Texas Instruments INA3221, which is a current current and bus voltage monitor. And basically that thing monitors the voltage drop across shunts placed on NVIDIA cards. And basically the shunts connect all of the 12 volt power to the G rest of the GPU. So like this shunt right here might connect on one side to this part of the VRM. So these three phases and the other end of it connects to the six pin, right? So any power this mon this VRM right here uses uh, has to go through that shunt so you can measure how much power is going into the VRM. Now this shunt might also be hooked up to that LED thing there. Uh, the memory VRM up here might even be hooked up to the fan control fan connector. I don't know, I've never had one of these cards in hand. It's not exactly hard to figure out how this is wired up, but without the card in hand, it's impossible. So, you know, that shunt basically monitors all the power going through it, and anything on the other side of the shunt is therefore measured as part of the shunt's power consumption, as power consumption through the shunt. Uh, same goes for, like, this one. This one might be hooked up to the other part of the VRM, this VRM down here, possibly this one up here. You know, like, how th the details of how these are hooked up doesn't matter. Basically, what matters is as current goes through these shunts, and these shunts are hooked up to every single 12-volt input on an NVIDIA card. So like this card has three 12 volt inputs. So you have the PCIe slot, you have your six pin and you have your eight pin. So you have your one shunt here, one shunt there and another shunt here. So we have three shunts for three 12 volt inputs, which means 
that the card knows exactly how much power it is pulling through the PCIe slot and through the 8-pin and the 6-pin. Um, and the INA3221 just reports the current and voltage readings to the NVIDIA driver, and then the NVIDIA driver makes the necessary adjustments to GPU core clock to stay within the power limit. So if the INA3221 measures a average power consumption of 320 watts on a card with a 300 watt power limit, uh, the driver's gonna go, hey, uh, slow down. And if it measures 280 watts or 260 watts or some, something lower than the power limit, the driver's gonna be like, yo, uh, you can speed up. Uh, up to a certain point. Obviously, if you set an NVIDIA card to have a 600 watt power limit, it's not going to try overclock itself to 3 gigahertz. It's just going to overclock itself to the highest uh, available state in the power play, uh, the, well, it's not power play, but the, the boost 3.0 voltage and frequency table. It's just going to go up to the highest available state, which might be like 2.1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz if you're overclocked or something like that. A lot of cards at stock will be hitting around 1900 because that's where the Power, uh, that's where the table maxes out on stock. Obviously, once you apply an overclock, that entire table moves upwards, so you get a higher max frequency available, and that max frequency is used whenever the power consumption isn't exceeding or the thermals are low enough. So that's how NVIDIA does their power management. They know exactly how much the entire GPU is pulling because they have three 12 shunts on the 12-volt rails monitoring how much power is going through them. Now let's take a look at the AMD approach, or the not an approach. This is an RX 480. You may notice that there are zero shunt resistors on this card. I mean, for, for those, you know, sort of new to the topic, these aren't shunt resistors, these are marked 000, these are basically just bridges. And they exist on PCBs like this one because AMD, uh, because when you design a PCB, you often have something that you're not entirely sure if you want to implement it one way or another way. So you'll give yourself solder pads like these and then use these zero ohm bridges to connect those things, depending on what you end up deciding to actually do with the PCB. Because if you bridge this right here, you're actually going to end up hooking up, because normally an RX4, uh, RX 480 like this one, these three phases of the VRM are on the PCIe slot. These three phases are on the 6-pin. Um, and if you bridge this, what actually ends up happening is you connect the 6-pin and the PCIe slot 12-volt power planes into one piece. Um, now, if you were to actually, depending on the arrangement of these various bridge, you know, bridges that the card has, um, you can actually basically make the card only use the 6-pin or only use the PCIe slot or whatever it is that you actually wanted to do. Um, but that's just a sort of like PCB design thing. These are not current shunts. Uh, the card completely lacks any kind of current shunt monitoring system. There's no INA3221 or an equivalent to an INA3221 anywhere on the card. Um, so anybody who's dug into the BIOS for an RX480, you'd know that most RX480s have a 110-watt power limit. Um, and excuse my scribbles being worse than ever, I'm currently using the mouse. Well, actually, they're not worse than ever. They're just worse than you probably got used to, But because um, I have been using the tablet a lot. But we're, we're going to use the mouse for this because we're not going to spend that much time on the cards. But an RX 480's BIOS power limit is around 110 watts. The actual cards themselves in reviews pulled anything between 150 and 165. I think that's the highest one I've seen, 165. There's a very good reason for why the cards exceed that 150 watt power rating that they're, they have, um, because that 110 watt power limit applies only to the GPU core, because that's the only thing on this card which actually has uh, communication to the driver about how much power is going through it. And even then, the GPU core power consumption is not measured very accurately. Um, see, the way the current draw is measured on an RX 480 for the GPU core, how that power limit is implemented, is that the International Rectifier IR3567B, or, three, well, I'm going to use a 3521 data sheet because 35211 data sheet here because it's the most comp, like the, the most detailed data sheet I can find for inter international rectifier voltage controller. They all use the same current sensing methodology anyway. Well, all the ones we've seen on cards. So this applies to every AMD card using an IR voltage controller or an NCP series, the on semiconductor NCP81022. Same methodology, different manufacturer. Um, but basically, all of these uh, chips, they use 
a circuit which relies on... Wait, where did my... What? Where did this go? Oh, it's down here. Ugh. Okay, so if we go to the typical application diagram here, we can see that, you know, we have the inductor here and we have these pins iSense1, IRTN1, iSense2, IRTN2. So let's let's go look at those up because I stands for current in electronics. So if we go down here, we can see iSense3 current, uh, phase three current sense input, phase three sense current input positive, short to pin 44 if not used. Funny thing is there's no pin 44 on this. I think that's a typo, short to pin 45. They're like this freaking voltage controller doesn't have a pin 45 you can see it stops at 40. so that that's kind of funny but I, I assume what they mean is short 39 to 40 uh 37 to 32 because normally if you short these two the the current sense pins together uh on ir voltage controllers it disables that phase output um at least that's how it works for like a 3567a and a 3567b but anyway, um, those are the current sense pins. So those measure the current draw. And how they measure current draw is basically you have the inductor. So these things right here. And inductors have DC current resistance. They act really funky if you run alternating current through them. You know, they, they do the whole, they charge up, they discharge, they charge up, they discharge. But if you just ran constant current through an inductor you wouldn't get that at all and you could actually use an inductor like a shunt um because well actually you could use any random piece of wire as a shunt hell if you had enough voltage you could probably use a paper as a shunt um <laughs> but it would suck um but if you have an object through which you have current going through it uh, and you know how much resistance that object has, you can calculate how much current is going through the object by measuring the voltage drop across the object. So you can use an inductor as a current shunt. There's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't want to do that most of the time, mostly because inductors aren't manufactured with very high tolerances for direct current resistance. Ultimately, these things are like, basically the tolerances on these are terrible compared to real current shunts. Um, and the end result is that the overall accuracy of monitoring current going through an inductor is really inaccurate. It goes all over the place depending on uh, inductor temperature, um, what day in the factory it was manufactured. It's not a great way to monitor current if you actually want accurate readings. The reason why something like an IR35211 uses this methodology of current monitoring is because it's used for phase load balancing. So you can basically measure the current going through each inductor um, with some level of halfway decent accuracy. For example, if we actually go to the, um, there is an accuracy rating somewhere here. And we have it, right. Current out accuracy reporting plus minus 2% typically. It's typically around plus minus 2%. So it's not exactly accurate, is it? Um, but it is enough that basically you can tell that, okay, one phase is pushing like twice as much current as another phase. In that situation, you'd want to, you know, rebalance the loading of the phases. And the voltage controller can do that. And this is used for maintaining uh, like voltage stability and it also makes sure that the loading of the mosfets is even so that you don't have one mosfet fail prematurely just because it always was pushing more current than all the other phases so you know that's what that current monitoring system exists for it's to make sure that the phases are well balanced it doesn't exist for actual proper current monitoring that's not what it's meant for unfortunately because amd doesn't actually have any real current shunts anywhere on an RX 480 or any other AMD GPU either, um, AMD resorted to using current output as the power limit for an RX 480. Um, so the end result is that 110 watt power limit basically applies to current going through the inductor and out, um, which introduces even more error. So we can measure how much current is going through the inductor pretty inaccurately because inductors suck at being accurate. There's thermal, like the VRM temperature is going to skew it. The inductor manufacturing itself, it's going to skew it. Um, the tolerances of the capacitors, resistors, all of that is just accuracy is terrible. 
You know what's even worse? Um, it completely ignores any power losses on the high side MOSFET. That's not taken into account at all. It's just gone. You know, doesn't exist. High side MOSFET, 100% efficient. Um, driver power losses, right? The driver chips, ignore those as well. Those don't produce heat either. Um, all these capacitors right behind the VRM, those don't pull any power either. Basically, this current monitoring methodology ignores the entire 12 volt side of the VRM. Doesn't exist. We don't know how much power that's using. So it's not only pretty inaccurate as far as being, you know, accurate goes in terms of just what it can measure, it just can't measure some parts of the VRM's power consumption at all anyway. So it's horrific as far as being accurate goes. Um, and the end result is that, you know, your 110 watt GPU core power limit on an RX 480 translates to, say, something between 120 and 125 watts power consumption going into the actual VRM. Now, that wouldn't be a problem, would it? Because that's still under that 150 watt power limit of the entire card, except that's the vCore VRM. If we all, you know, if you watched my RX 480 breakdowns, you'd know that RX 480s don't run on vCore alone. There's also memory power, which is this VRM up here. There's also the memory controller power, which is this VRM over here. Then there's the display drive, which is down here. Um, what else is there? Oh yeah, there's a fan on the card. Fans pull power too. Are we measuring that? No, we're not measuring that. Measuring circuitry is expensive. An INA3221 costs about a $1 if you're buying it bulk off DigiKey. I'm pretty sure if AMD wanted to, they could convince Texas Instruments to sell it to them for less than a dollar. And shunts really aren't that expensive, so I'm not buying that cost save. Like, if, if having terrible current monitoring is a cost-saving measure, it's a terrible cost-saving measure. It doesn't save any money at all. Like, it's literally probably around a dollar or two per card. So, yeah. But the end result is you have all these other VRMs. Those aren't controlled by the IR3567B. They're controlled by the lovely and completely idiotic GS Tech chip right here. That's a GS7256. Um, and there's two of these things on this. Oh, also this right here. That is a low dropout regulator that provides the gate drive voltage for the VRM. Do you think they're monitoring how much power that consumes? Nope. Um, of course not. <laughs> it doesn't have a... Like, so basically, you have all these lovely things. These are 8-pin voltage controllers. You can probably guess that these don't have any intelligent interface. But if you don't, you know, you're hard to convince. Here's the data sheet for these. And I don't know why that confidential is there. I didn't, like, I found this data sheet on Google. So GS Tech can take that confidential and shove it somewhere, but uh, either way, as you can clearly see, it has VCC, which is power in for the GS7256, then we have compensation and enable, so that's the compensation and enable pin for the chip, so that's what turns it on, and that kind of thing. OC set, so this thing does actually have overcurrent protection, I know, except it can't report current readings. Um, because, well, there's no interface on it. Then we have FB, which is feedback, low gate drive phase, high gate drive boot. Basically, this is never going to tell you how much power is going through the VRM it's controlling, ever. Um, end result is that if you have your RX 480, right, and we, we take into account that the VRM is pulling something between 120 and 125 watts, in order to hit that 165 watt power limit, the rest of the card is probably pulling around 40 watts. And there's nothing on the card to actually figure that out. There's no measurement circuit tree for that remaining 40 watts. The power, the fan, not monitored. The auxiliary rail, not monitored. The memory power, not monitored. The display drive, not monitored. Um, any of the 12 volt capacitors, which do cause some power loss, not monitored. Uh, end result, RX 480s exceed their TDP because, well, um, they don't. Right? Technically, the card never violates the power limit it has written in its BIOS, but it is completely wrong of AMD to claim that this card has a power limit of 150 watts. Because um, it doesn't. It has a 110 watt power limit for the GPU core on the output side of the VRM. Great. I mean, like, absolutely great. Um, 
and personally as an overclocker i don't really see this as a massive issue but from the perspective of amd and you know not following their own specification you might have wanted to actually put some real current measurement circuitry on the freaking card if you were going to put it so close uh in terms of like the power limit because they really were cutting it super close right if they didn't try like 110 watts on the core after vrm efficiency losses you're looking at okay so you're left with what like 30 um for this memory system and they just assumed that the memory system is never gonna exceed 30 watts that the fan is never gonna like the fan the display drive the memory system it's never gonna exceed 30 watts that's a that's a terrible approach to you know doing your power management because basically there's a good chunk of the gpu that you don't know how much power it's pulling and like, well, we can see the results. These cards violated uh, PCIe spec. Um, not that that's a huge issue, because that spec is ridiculously conservative, and it's not going to burn your house down, but this could have been avoided if AMD just went and used real current monitoring systems, you know, instead of guesswork. Because really, this is guesswork, right? Yeah, you can measure how much power the GDDR5 and memory controller pull in a lab, that doesn't mean that power consumption is going to be the same for every card you ship. Unless you also, unless you've tested like a huge number of cards and then intention, like, like, like basically the only way they could have made this work is, is if they gave themselves a bigger error margin, right? Because they were really cutting it close. They're off by 10% overall so if they basically limited to the, the gpu core to 90 watts instead of 110 watts there wouldn't have ever been a risk of the card exceeding its power limit except the card would have been pulling a lot like wouldn't run as fast so yeah um not not a great approach here is it but that that is a major difference in how nvidia and amd handle their power management or how amd doesn't do it and nvidia does um uh, and if you're boss modding or if you're overclocking any AMD cards, keep in mind that any power readings you see can't be full board power readings because the board doesn't have the circuitry to measure how much power it's consuming. It's just not there. Um, you can measure output power. And you can, even, you can even use a really dodgy calculation to estimate input power. which we have right here this this equation right here it's really dodgy though because you're still going off of the output current which i as i said it's not very accurate even measuring that because you're it's not supposed to be accurate uh then you multiply it by your duty cycle which that'll be accurate voltage in which is actually measured by all these cards because you have to measure that um for the functioning of the vrm and all that so that that is monitored um, this right here is just assumed as VRM efficiency of 85%. Considering that VRM efficiency changes depending on how much power the VRM is outputting. So like an RX4, like a Vega VRM at stock is about 90%, even 90 plus percent efficient. So if you just use this 85% assumption, you're wrong. You know, you're, you're overestimating your power consumption. And as you overclock the card, your efficiency is going to get worse on the VRM because you're pushing more power through it. And if your efficiency ever drops below that 85% figure, then you're underestimating how much power you're pulling. So, yeah. Um, th this, this current measurement system that AMD uses, not great. Really, like, not great. Again, if you're overclocking and you know what you're doing, not an issue. But if you're trying to get power readings or you're trying to do cal efficiency calculations or something like that, like you're trying to figure out how, how much power you saved undervolting your Vega card or something, um, just keep in mind, you're not seeing full board power consumption at all. You're seeing V-Core and I think HBM on Vega. On an RX 480, you're only seeing V-Core. The rest of the card is powered by things that don't have an interface uh, at all. Um, HD 7970s are... I think are V core and memory off of the voltage controller it varies card to card. So basically you don't know, right? It's a dodgy way to measure power. Um, 
And, you know, it is, I guess it's a cost saving measure, a pretty terrible one, if you ask me, because as I said, INA 3221s are not expensive and shunt resistors aren't either. Um, especially considering that NVIDIA can be bothered to use those when the rest of their cards is usually horrifically down-costed compared to AMD cards, but... Yeah. That, that's the... That, that's the difference in their power ma ma management systems. That's the fundamental difference. And, uh, hopefully... This clears up some misunderstandings for a lot of people, because I've seen tech tubers and, uh... I, I, I've seen far too many people report AMD GPU power consumption numbers thinking that they're actually full, full GPU power consumption. When they're not, you're measuring core only because the rest of the card doesn't even have the circuitry to measure power consumption. So, yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. And uh, if you would like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon and PayPal. There's shirts. You can find all of those things down in the description below. It's all on one link. Um, uh, if you have any questions or comments, there's a comment section. You can drop those down there. And I will be seeing you next time.